special time, like a, maybe after service um, in the next couple of weeks. And we're just going to gather and pray for uh, God to give us the man of God that he wants to us. And so we're going to, you know, I'll let you know when that's going to happen, but, you know, we just recognize that we can do all the searching we want, and we can try and do all the human stuff, which is good. We have to do that. But ultimately, we really want God to, you know, make the right man to try and this new person. So, um, that's what I have for you. And if you have any questions, you can always catch me after. So, all right. Thank you. Absolutely. We're still in transition on our sound. We keep finding some new electrical bug, and I have a feeling it has something to do with the, the ground issue after we did some stuff down in the green panel and replaced the uh, uh, AC unit downstairs. Because all this showed up after that, and we're starting to find that it has something to do. So be praying for our worship team. They, they have been working so hard to in preparation and doing all this stuff. They completely uh, the sound we had this morning wasn't anything that was already up here on stage. We brought in a whole new set from our youth stuff and brought everything up and they get it all set up and we still have pop in the system. So it's an isolated thing, not even in, that lets us know that we're dealing with something a little harder to find or we need a little more speci uh, specified skill set, I think. So be praying for them and that. I'm just really proud of the hard work they've done to keep us going. So, oh, we'll go ahead again. I'm used to preaching to the kids on Wednesday night. I can be real loud. If there's anybody hard to hear him, I'll get close. So uh, it's kind of funny. Let me pray real quick. Father God, we just praise you. We thank you. We, we ask right now that you would just fill us with your spirit. Give us understanding this morning for what you're speaking to us. Lord, let us not hear things in our own flesh, our own wisdom, our own understanding. But Lord, let us hear from you this morning. We ask that your word would grow us, that it would encourage us, equip us. Lord, help us to find unity in what you're saying. Lord, let us be one voice together in your spirit. Lord, you're never pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, go ahead and if you can pull up the slide, L, that's got a uh, map on it. There we go. Um, you see the black dot in the middle up high? It says Caesarea Philippi, kind of in the middle, you know, purple. He was just out of Galilee. He just went 25 miles up to that area right there. And that area is really kind of a cool place. I did a little research. Of what is going on there? What? Because I've never been there. Um, I've been to Israel, so I've got to see a lot of cool places. But there was places I've never been to. So when you when you read things and they got this designated thing, this area is known as the Springs. They have a lot of amazing water, um, little even waterfalls and springs coming out of the ground. There's caves and caverns, and there's a specific. Uh, uh, Specific grotto or cavern that, that the pagans up there worshipped the Pan God, uh, the God Pan, uh, at this place. So it was known in that um, Caesarea Philippi. That was kind of what they were known for. And some of those things. There were some interesting things there. Um, I'm not going to go into who the God Pan is. I can care less. We got more important things. Study our God, right? What's he saying? So uh, let's let's go into Mark chapter eight. So he just moved from the Sea of Galilee where we were, you know, a couple weeks ago before. Chris was going to share last. He just moved 25 miles with his disciples up on this journey. This is where this is what's going on. Okay. Remember last week he was doing that amazing miracles. He was um, spitting on guys' eyes and doing some cool things. Cool. All right. Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. So interesting because it just says they left. You know how that's another three to four or five day journey depending on how long and what how big their group is and. So, again, time with Jesus. Remember, there's all this overarching thing that Jesus is trying to show us, this kingdom of God perspective, and he's discipling his disciples. He's showing them how to live, what to do, and this is all part of this process. As they were walking along, he asked them, Who do people say I am? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. And others say you were one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? I'm going to stop right there. Jesus is asking us this morning, who do you say I am? And if we start actually thinking about who Jesus is and what he is to us, what does that actually mean for us? Having knowledge of who he is, we're going to hear from Peter in a second who he thinks he is. It's pretty awesome. But for us, who is Jesus, and what does that mean? So if I if I realize things in the Word of God, and I understand what 
I have a new grasp or, a, or an old grasp but just being fresh to my thought. This is important. What does that mean now? So I take this information and I do something with it. it what's that mean? If, you see what I'm saying? That's When he asks this question, it's with the intent to seek our heart. Okay? He's speaking to us in the same way. Peter responds, you are the Messiah. Jesus stops in verse 30 and says he warned them not to tell anyone about him. I want to go to Isaiah. We're going to go back to the um, old Isaiah chapter 9. And we're going to be, this is the, the prophet Isaiah talking about the Messiah, the coming one. This is Jesus hearing from Peter. Who is that? What Peter is referring to, who he is, okay? Because this is what they would have known. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. That's not ending. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. Who do you say I am? Are those things things that we think about when we say who Jesus is? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. You guys know what it means to have a Prince of Peace? He's going to remove all things that take peace away, and he will establish his peace in us when we surrender to him. So this idea of who Jesus is, obviously he's the Son of God. We, we know these things as Christians. We come to church, we've been hearing this, but he's these other things too. This is important for us to understand this relationship he wants to have with us. When, when Peter says, Messiah, he's saying these things, the Savior of the world, the planned one. These things are very, very important in perspective. I don't want to, I don't want to um, belabor this, but I, I want you to understand. I don't think any of us can actually understand who Jesus is unless we have the, the Holy Spirit reveal fully who He is to us. So I, I want to um, go to John. We're going to go to the Book of John real quick and read John chapter seven, part of it real quick. And this is important. This is perspective. This is what the Lord put on me this week in, in preparation. So, John chapter 7, verse 37. We're starting right there. On this day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowd. Anytime Jesus stops and shouts, oh, we, gotta, we better be listening. If we were in the crowd, he's trying to get attention to the festival, all this stuff. But he shouts to the crowd, listen, this, this is Jesus, this is heart. Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit, who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. Do we have something that they hadn't experienced yet at the time of this writing, or you know, what it's referring to? Yeah, we have the Holy Spirit. We have the, the living water of God. This living water that pours into us, that establishes the seed roots, that pours the growth into us, that matures us into the things that we're, we're trying to become for His glory. And then we start asking, who do you say I am, Father? And we, say, we call Him Messiah. But do we live like He's our Messiah? Do we live like He's our wonderful Counselor? Do we live like he's all the answers we'll ever need and ever seek? Or do we keep acting like we know of this God, but we don't seek him for these things because that's not culturally what we do? Is he enough? Is he everything? The Spirit of God, the living water. I ask you to right now, I plead to your heart. I ask that you would open your heart up to the Holy Spirit, that you would reveal your need, that he would not only reveal your need for him, but you would repent and make room. If we're walking in our flesh and we're doing things in our own understanding, of our own making, 
we're missing the opportunity to be a Jesus-shaped life maker. He's calling us to be disciples, guys. He's teaching his disciples in this section of scripture, and it's really cool, but it's super challenging. I'm going to be honest. It sounds really good to just be a Christian on Sunday to go to church and our family, everything's real dialed, and then the world's chaos out there. We just kind of keep ourselves. But that's not what he's calling us to. He's calling us to lay down this life, our life, our plans, our restrictions, and our thoughts, and trust him and do things his way. And the only way we're going to hear is through the Spirit. The only way this living water has to come into us. He's got to reveal to us his heart. I can't give this to you. God can. The Holy Spirit can. But you have to make room. You have to be willing. Anybody who's rejecting the Holy Spirit, are you going to hear from him? He's going to be that still, small voice. He's going to be the one, when you're out there in the wilderness, out there in, in, in you know, chaos and fear, he's going to be the one, child, turn to me. My way is different. There's things here. Okay, we're going to go back here. This, this section, Jesus just hears from Peter. The disciples basically, through Peter, declare him as the Messiah. They know, obviously, the, you know, what in some of the other <laughs> books it's kind of the context is really funny because you know what else would we do? Where would we go? <laughs> who, who else is gonna be like you? We we know you have the answers. Remember, he's calmed the storms, he's he's I mean multiplied the loaves, he's done all these amazing things, but is he the Messiah to them yet? It's interesting. Let's keep let's listen here. Then, this is verse 31, then Jesus began to tell them. That the Son of Man must suffer and many terrible things. He would be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. Uh, that's, who, who's he going to have to be rejected by? The church at that time. The people that had the established authority, the, the understanding. And I'm going to be honest, we were just like this now. Because the kingdom of God isn't flesh and blood, but it's... The things of God that we are learning from His will, His purpose. We can't see them in our flesh. We can't understand them unless He reveals them to us. So we kind of are the same way. We're going to have to reject certain things in certain ways to be able to stand with the Lord in faithfulness and obedience. Amen. And our religiousness, our heart sometimes, it's a war. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm, I hate religion. I'm probably the least religious pastor you have in your life. But I love my relationship with Jesus. But the religiousness comes into us so quick. We get used to things being a certain way. And we get comfortable. And, and we like. How many of us like comfort? How many of us like that feeling? And when Jesus is about to call us into something different. Oh man, that's scary. I don't know if I'm ready for that. Lord, show us your way. Teach us your will. Show us that path. You see what I'm saying? Okay, let's listen here. He said he would be killed. But three day, days later, he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, I like that. It says he was there intentionally to point that out. Now it's not through parables and through, hey, this, you know, if you, if you understand, if you have a perception, now he's openly speaking. He's teaching what's to come, why it's coming, but they still aren't perceiving. They still have their agenda in what they're hearing. But he's sharing openly with them now, which is really important. Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying these things. <laughs> Hashtag Jesus you made smart I got this now How many of us do that? Let, let me ask this question What kind of leader was Peter? We all want to make fun of Peter But he was a strong leader And he was fearless Courageous I mean like the guy would be a good leader today But he was leading in his wisdom His understanding And he was like You know together we can do this Jesus we don't have to allow this to happen In his mind he was trying to control this good thing that he saw God doing in Jesus, and he, he just didn't want to end. And Jesus is talking about, it's, I'm dying, things are changing. And he wasn't ready to listen. This, how many of us in our heart, you know, like where we're at? But if he's calling us to something greater, something has to die to make room. Amen. This is us. So listen. Jesus turned around. I love this. So Jesus turned around, and he doesn't just confront Peter. He turns around, looks at his disciples. He's like, and then he... So he gets everybody's attention. If you think about that, we're in a room, we're talking, one of them grabs a side, and I, I, I pause. There, everybody knows there's a little conflict there. Pause. Everybody else is paying attention. I get everybody's attention. Then I address it. What am I doing? What's Jesus doing here? He's engaging them into this understanding. This is bigger. You, you guys have to see this, right? So this is what he says. Get away from me, Satan, he said. 
You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. And remember, guys, Jesus is flesh at this point. He is tempted in the same ways. And so the things that Peter's feeling, he feels. He understands this. That's why he says, get away from me because you can tempt me to, to disobey the will of the Father. You can cause me to stumble, right? Obviously, he's not going to. But he addresses this situation. You are seeing things from the wrong point of view. Human point of view. Not God's. Let me ask that question. Who is the Messiah? Who is this person? Who do you say he is? Who is God's son? Who is God? What does that mean? Is this changing our perspective of the big picture, the plan? When we know something new and he's equipping us and encouraging us and we're edifying each other, excited. How many of you guys come along somebody in your life that's just full of excitement and fire and they just make, make life easier to be around them? You know what I'm saying? That, that excitement, that encouragement, that joy. When you have people in your life do that for you, it's just like, man, you want to be around those people. That's exciting, right? Well, God's calling us in his spirit to come around each other, get excited about what God's doing in us so that it can go produce something for the kingdom. You guys understand, it's not just to make us feel good hanging where we're at. Jesus, the whole time, is modeling this kingdom perspective, going somewhere specifically to unlock somebody in this knowledge of who he is so that they can then share their testimony, share the testimony of what Jesus has just done, freeing people from the wickedness of this world. That is what this is bigger, this bigger perspective. But now, let's, let's keep listening. What does Jesus say next? Then calling the crowd to join his disciples. So he had a message that wasn't just for those. Anybody who would listen, the crowd that was there, okay? From here on out, everywhere Jesus is, there's a crowd. His, his reputation has preceded him. These things are going to be like this. This is interesting, but it's really cool. Any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. Let's pause right there. For the sake of the good news. For my sake. Is he saying there's a difference between our thoughts and plan versus his? Yeah. He's saying that our flesh worldly thoughts and our flesh worldly plans aren't necessarily his will. And He's saying, you've got to lose this life. Be willing to surrender it down and pick up the cross that he's calling us to bear. And it might, be a, it might be a challenge. But man, when we do, we will lose the old life and pick up a new life. A life with the peace of the Lord. With the living water that he's called talking about in Luke. Or sorry, with John. The, the reality here, guys, the reality is the Holy Spirit is doing something. Are we going to listen and allow it to come into us? This is such a kid's Bible study story. I mean, since we were kids, if you're in church, you've heard this story. But do we go to that place where I know this, I understand this, or do we go, Lord, show me what I'm missing so I can be faithful in this next window? Our faithfulness literally comes when we actually hear what we're supposed to do and don't reject it because we think we already can know. We're telling God, I don't need to know from you what you're saying to me. I already know. Are we producing the fruit we call the fruit to produce? Are we seeing the kingdom advance around us? Or are we standing in the same place, doing the same things year after year, calling it fruit, but it's not changing the lives of those around us? The kingdom of God is supposed to advance in us. Let's read some farther here. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul. We love to focus on that because then that kind of gives our perspective change again. This, we're not made for this world, guys. We are, we're eternal beings. He's going to give us an opportunity to choose life, life abundantly here, but that life is going to end on this earth and it's going to go forward in a new body for eternity, either with the Lord or away from God's presence. That's the, that's the reality of how he created us image he made us, and the purpose he had behind everything. But he loves us so much he gave us free will, and the good news of the gospel, that Jesus takes our wickedness, our sin, our, 
our stuff and makes us righteous when we believe upon him. So there's not one thing that we have to do by earning the right thing. We just have to have a heart for the Lord surrendered, and we're going to go do these things. We're going to learn how. But he, it's not us getting good enough. That's the Galatians way. We, we can't workspace this. Once I've seen you long enough, doing the right thing long enough, then I'll trust that you're going to be. No, that's not what God wants for us. He wants us to put our whole trust in him. Are we willing, guys, to lay this life down and pick up this plan, this call? He's calling us to discipleship. He's calling us to reach the world with the good news. Who of you shared the good news with this week? Who's God asked you to and maybe you didn't? Is anything worth more than your soul? I don't think so. If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in glory, sorry, in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So not only do we, we can't be ashamed of Jesus, but it's his message, the word. There's things that the world would tell us, okay, yeah, Jesus was a man, obviously he walked, he was a good prophet, all this, but, you know, some of that stuff he taught, we don't, that was for then, not for now. We don't really agree with that. The world would, is always trying to throw monkey wrenches in this stuff. And actually, many people, I, as I was studying through this section of scripture, um, there's a lot of people that reject this as even being a true story because what kind of person, what kind of God would tell the person that uh, he just said was full of Satan that he was also going to build his church in that man? Context. You've got to have the spirit of understanding to understand what he's speaking about in this whole thing, right? He was mad at Peter because Peter didn't get it at that moment. But he also tells Peter later because when Peter turns back after think about what Peter did, he denied him three times. And then he still, be my sheep, be my sheep, be my sheep. But don't let the world and their fear of trusting the Lord, their fear of understanding, their lack of water from the Lord, you know, that spiritual water, they lack understanding. Who is this God? say I am? What is he calling us to? What is his purpose? I don't want us to reject the teachings of Jesus so that we can fit in with things of this world. We need to stand firm on a firm foundation. The word of God is true. It is right. And it's his will for us. I'm teaching my kids on, we, we have a cool thing that we do every day. I, I'm studying through the Bible um, chapter by chapter by verse with my kids. We just finished the book of Leviticus. I don't know if you guys know, that's a hard book to get through with kids. And we just did it. But there's, there's some, if you go start going through it, just reading through it and see what the Holy Spirit reveals and have conversations, there's so much about the way God establishes his expectation and his plans. The old covenant, he's making a new covenant, obviously. Jesus started this new thing. But he's still, happy. He's still that same God that wants to be seen as righteous, and he wants his people to live righteously. He wants us to come out of the world and be different, set apart. He wants us to be light and salt. He wants us to love like he loves. And as we go in this next section, you'll hear why the Lord is showing this to us. He's given me a directive, guys. Um, Jesus-shaped examples, okay? If he is the Messiah and he is calling us to something, what is he saying? Let's listen to this example. So let's go to uh, Luke chapter 10, okay? And we're going to be in verse... stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. I love it when they test him. Every time. You think Jesus is going to be fooled by the test? But it's the revealing. How, how many times do we want to test people ourselves? We want to know something. You know, it's kind of still in us in the same way. But they're testing Jesus, and the motive is to trap him. The motive is to make him look less and so they can promote them using his all his authority, all these things that he's been doing to make so they can stand on top of that pile. You see what I'm saying? This motive. Testing him. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? I love how Jesus replies. 
question. What does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? So Jesus doesn't respond and give in to the, the, the trap. He wants to hear, and, and if they can't respond here, it's going to make them look bad at this group. You remember, you think Jesus ever had these, I bet there was some that took him to the side and asked him questions, but in this situation, where was this at? In front of people. It's always in a, in a questioning, hey, let me ch check you, let me test you, right? In this context, I just love this. So, the man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And you love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this, and you will live. So, he knew what he was supposed to do. Jesus says, you're right, go do this. That's what you Good job. Why are you, why are you testing me? What do you, you know? So go do it. Right? Calls him cut out. But the man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I'm always um, kind of shocked when you read through something in Scripture again over after years or after maybe you've matured and see things differently and understand what Jesus is showing you now. Um, this section of Scripture, they're tied together. This parable is specific, not just on its own. It's in regard to what this man was saying and the neighbor and why. And obviously, yes, I've heard it this way, but it's revealing to me why. This is so, Jesus is giving us a directive through this guy's question and he responds. And then he gives us the action. He shows us how, what that means, and what kind of heart we're supposed to have. So are you guys going to put your spiritual ears on? Listen. Have that living water to soak in what he's speaking to us. This is for us this morning, okay? Listen. Jesus replied with the story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. What's a priest? Where did priests work? In the temple. So he was, to be a priest, they were elevated and established, they had knowledge, they had understanding, there was a lot of things specifically to get that priest title and rabbi, those type of things. So he's calling this religious teacher out. He's like, this, this is the guy that's on your par, okay? Context. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. Just kind of sides, keeps going, sideswipes that, this is a reality check. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there. Let's, I did a little word search on that. It's a Levite. If you go back into the Old Testament, into Exodus and Leviticus, the Levites were literally Aaron's sons and that line, and they were specifically called up to run the temple, to be part of the priestly duties and do those things. So this assistant was in that line. He was saying, this, these people know the law. This person, in his parable, understands what's important. And then this is their example. Even, even though the priest saw it, he stepped past this person, the reality is coming. Are we seeing what he's saying? This is us. How many of us know? We know what the right thing to do. Listen. The temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed on the other side. There's something interesting that happened there. Did you guys He walked over and he looked. What's it? What happens to us a lot of times? We like to look at the hard things that are going on around us and the hard things or bad things that are going on in people. We look, make an evaluation, then we go about our business. We look just like this assistant, this Levi. We do the exact same thing in our lives sometimes. And God's calling us to do something different. He's, we know the story. We know the, the despised Samaritan. <laughs> I love it. Then a despised Samaritan. I, I mean, when I was a, when I was a, in high school, I got to go on a mission trip, and I, I went to Italy, Israel, and we worked at a community college that actually had Palestinians and Jewish Christians both in the same college. It's one of a kind. The only place in the world that was was right there in Italy, a little tiny small village, beautiful thing. And this. When you understand what God does in people once that animosity goes away and we find that our identities in Him and these other things, this cultural bias and all these other things, 
I mean, right now, the Palestinians and the Jews in Israel right now are hating each other's guts and shooting rockets back and forth, and one is so afraid to, to I mean, it's, the lie of the enemy is still there, okay? I saw in some lives that that wasn't the case. When God reveals himself and he's, and they surrender to the Lord, they see each other as brothers or cousins and sisters, you know, it's like, it's a whole different thing. I, I got to experience that as a young man, and, and so it probably changed my perspective of what God can do, because you don't hear those stories very often. I got to go paint at a college and make it all nice and do a bunch of stuff in, in between, and then we got to meet a bunch of those people. It was just really cool. But they hate each other over there, guys. This, this context, the Samaritans and the Jews, um, the Jews had such a piety. They thought they knew everything, and they were waiting. Everybody else that was just pagan didn't get it, and they didn't have any time to teach them or show them. It was... They knew, and they were so much better and so much higher. So there was this, and they would never make an effort to even talk to them because they don't get it. They just don't get it. We didn't, we're just different. We're going to separate. We're not going to make any effort. Jesus is literally bringing that bias, that culture, into their face. And he says, it's the Samaritan in this story that's going to do the right thing. Let's finish this part. We'll keep talking about it. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. So he saw as well, and then he felt compassion. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Those things were both very valuable, and Jesus was bringing context to what's important. Olive oil and wine and bandages were, you know, very... Or he didn't just pick him up, throw him kind of drag him to a spot where the Samaritan people could take him back to their village and take care of him. He, he got off, took his stuff, and helped this person, this, this Jewish person that was beaten down and left for dead. And Jesus is like, you, you, it's going to cost you something. And then we see the cost gets even greater. We understand that sometimes the financial things can be greater, but also the effort, the, the time. You guys know what being a disciple is? Make room in your life to bring other people in that you can disciple. You got you to gotta make room in your life. Jesus made room in his life. When he got tired of the disciples, what did he do? He kept bringing them with him, didn't he? Even when they were being naughty, even when they were slacking. He'd go spend time in the wilderness or up on the mountain with the Lord a little bit here and there, and he was trying to model that for them, but he was always right there. He didn't ever go, I'm done with you guys, I'm going to look for some new disciples. What did he do? He stayed faithful, he stayed committed, he just kept training, he kept dragging them on. He put them in their place sometimes like he just did with Peter. He called them on their garbage when it was not right, when they were living wickedly and disobediently, and he, and he addressed things. But we have to make room in our life, guys. And Jesus has shown us that this is this Samaritan person didn't stop at what was inconvenient and then go only go so far. He put the man on his own donkey and took him to the inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. There's a, there's a follow-through and a commitment in this story, too. Does Jesus say things just accidentally and just kind of put it out there? I was just like, oh, that'd be cool if there was somebody like that out there. What is his motive in sharing this? And who's he talking to? Remember? Those disciples and then the, the crowd? All, he's speaking specifically, guys, in this way to us. This is a model for us. This is him. This is the heart I want for you. This is the willingness I need you to have. It might cost you. It might cost you reputation. What's the reputation of the Samaritan now with this people hanging out with the Jews? Awkward. <laughs> I don't know. I just think it's funny. Now Jesus says, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man? Who was attacked by bandits. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, now go and do the same. Remember, this is the same man that was coming to test Jesus. And in this example, do you think it stopped his press for, I think he saw himself. I think everybody there saw himself. Do you guys see yourself in this story? I do see myself every day now. It's, it's kind of scary how much I want to be the lead light. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to address it unless it's something that I think God's telling me to do, and not just. He's wanting us guys to step into the role and be who God's called us to be. We need to become Jesus-shaped. And if there's things in our life holding us back, 
It's time to cut, rip, cut ties with those things because they're from the world. They're things of this flesh. They're flesh. We're either of flesh or of spirit. And we need to be in the spirit of the Lord. We need to be of him. we got to do the will of the Father or we are not family of God that we think we are. And it's time to repent and come back in. The time is short. The parable of the ten virgins, that, that story is upon us. Are we going to have our oil full and our wicks trimmed? Are we ready are we going to be living the life in the way that we're supposed to? Are we going to be faithful? You know what I'm saying? The Lord is giving us His examples. When He shares these things, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to be disciples? Or are we just going to be hearers of the truth? Each one of you guys has that choice right now. Each one of you has this heart that God is opening up and revealing himself to you in. What are you going to do with that? He loves us so much. He loves you guys so much. It doesn't matter where you're at in the understanding yet. It doesn't matter where you're at. He wants to take you from this place and bring us to something new. He wants to let our trust grow from only what we can see and protect to God, you got us in every circumstance. What do you think the last seven years Pastor Nate's been doing in this church? He's been shifting us in preparation for a new thing. Are we going to be ready? Are we going to accept the soil that has been tilled, the plans that God has done in us? And are we going to step into the season next that's going to produce kingdom fruit in the lives around us? I shared first service. Now, I don't think we're going to be able to stop this message right here until we're faithful in doing it. It's not going to happen. God's going to keep bringing us right to this point where we have a choice. Every time, every teaching came to this point, it came to this choice. Are we going to be faithful? Are we going to accept? Are we going to surrender? You see what I'm saying? We cannot give something to somebody else we don't have. And the Lord is trying to give us himself. He's trying to give us his spirit. He's trying to give us his understanding. Today, is an important day for you. There's enough worries and trials and stuff coming down the road. Today is enough. What is he calling you today? What is this word from the Lord in your heart establishing you today? What have you heard now? What are you going to do about it? Is it going to produce something that brings glory to the Father? Or is it going to stop in us and just be another good thing we've heard? Like we've heard a thousand good stories from the Bible. Man, that, that book has got a bunch of good stories in it. Those stories transform us, equip us, and send us. Like the Samaritan, willing to reach somebody that didn't look like them, didn't act like them, didn't understand them. Are there people on our path right now that we don't understand fully, that we don't totally? It's not easy because we don't under, we don't get it. But he's calling us. One of the things that I really, really like um, about relationship with Jesus is as it grows, as our understanding of what he's speaking to us grows, and as we step into surrender in that, it grows in how the application steps, not just knowledge. It, it's like, this is how I can do it today. This is who I can talk to. He'll bring people to your path. And that's what I'm asking you to go to. Go to the Lord. Spend time with him. And allow him to do that. Okay? Let's be faithful this week. I'm going to pray over us, and we're going to close. Um, Hunter's going to come up and share some things. And I just I want you guys to um, join us in this next season. We, like Pastor Ken said, we're we're waiting on the Lord. We're asking Him to show us what it is He wants for us as a church. But I want every one of you guys to listen to the Lord and ask Him what He wants for you as an individual. Come and serve. Be part of this next season. There's so many hurt people, so many families going through things that you can be a huge blessing in. Whatever gift, whatever talent, whatever love or passion you have, God has given you that. Let's use it for the kingdom. Let's be about the business that God's called us to be about, okay? I want to pray for us. Father God, we just praise you. We thank you. Lord, we just thank you for your word and how good it is to us. That the heart that we have is sometimes so wicked away from you, God. Lord, we surrender it and we repent from our wicked hearts, our selfish and fleshly desires, Lord, to do things our way. Lord God, I ask that you would give us your wisdom would give us your understanding. Lord, let us remain faithful and steadfast. 
Lord, help us to trust your way, your path alone. Lord God, let the, let the church be all of us as people, not the building that people have to come to. Lord, let us go to the affirmed, go to those on the sidewalk roads and the byways that are hurting, those that you've already established relationship in us to go to see. Lord, let us be faithful. Lord, I pray your will be done in us and through us and over this next season for our church. Lord, we surrender to you. Lord God, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, you are everything. Lord, we want to know you the way you want us to know you. Teach us your ways. Father, in your name we pray. Amen.